Environment, and I must tell members that question one has been withdrawn. I therefore call Ms. Megan Fearon. Ms. Fearon. Question two, please. Minister. My department controls noise from airports through a number of policy areas. The Environmental Noise Directive requires member states to undertake mapping of road, rail, industry and airport noise sources every five years and subsequently produce noise action plans. Noise maps were prepared in 2012 based on 2011 noise source data. Both Belfast International Airport and George Best Belfast City Airport have prepared noise action plans during 2013, which I have approved following a public consultation. Noise at airports can be controlled by a planning agreement. Planning agreements are established under seven, Section 76 of the Planning Act 2011 and are used to overcome obstacles to the grant of planning permission where these cannot be addressed through planning conditions. Thus, planning agreements can be used to control noise at airports. George Best Belfast City Airport is the only Northern Ireland airport to have a planning agreement in force since 1997. My department's SPPS, published in September, emphasises the need for planning authorities to take account of the full range of environmental and amenity considerations, including noise impacts, when formulating development plan policies such as zoning land for particular uses, developing key site requirements and also in determining planning applications. Consultation with relevant experts, including environmental health professionals, may be necessary and it is important that authorities reach balanced decisions that weigh noise impacts against all other relevant material considerations. Fearing for supplementary. Can I get and I thank the Minister for his answer. Can I ask the Minister, does he have any particular concerns around this issue in relation to noise levels within the vicinity of our ports? And also when will we hear the findings of a public inquiry held around this issue at Belfast City Airport? I uh, thank the, the, the member for the question and indeed the, the supplementary. I know uh, many people, indeed many residents living in this vicinity, actually do have concerns about the impact of noise at airports. As someone who lives near the city of Derry Airport, I have a concern that there isn't enough noise added. I'd love to see and hear more flights coming in and going out on a daily basis. With regards to the PAC, report of the public inquiry into the proposed modification of the planning agreement with George Best Belfast City Airport. The department received that report from the PAC on the 30th of October this year and interested parties were notified that the report was received. Before releasing this report, which I haven't seen yet, I will consider the advice of my department on if and how the agreement should or could be potentially modified. The report will subsequently be made available to other stakeholders and the general public after it has been disclosed to the airport themselves as the other party to the planning agreement. Ms. Fergal McKinney. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, uh, perhaps the Minister could outline what further steps are then taken as part of the overall process to reach accommodation around what are uh, clearly, as he's articulated, differing views in this issue. Well, as, as, the, as the member puts it, there clearly are differing views on this issue, and I certainly do have a degree of sympathy with those living in the immediate vicinity of the airport who feel that the noise is or has become too much for them. Under the current agreement uh, with Bel uh, George Best Belfast City Airport, there are restrictions on seat numbers as well as restrictions on times of air traffic. Some of the breaches which residents and objectors uh, to the, the noise coming from the airport have pointed to, breaches of the times, for example, are beyond the control of George Best, Belfast City Airport, who, with, with whom I have met uh, last year and who certainly convinced me that they were doing all within their power to address these issues. Serious issues they are and they are ones that cause the residents serious concern. Now that uh, well, the airport's proposals were received in March 2012, a revised proposal and further information was received in 2013, and each submission was a subject of public consultation, and a significant number of representations were received. 
Interested parties also had the opportunity to, to submit evidence and appear before the PAC at the public inquiry. But now that the PAC report and recommendations have been formulated, considering all that evidence, it is not intended to consult with any parties on the PAC report or indeed to reopen the debate. It is for now my department and the airport to agree if and how the agreement should be modified, taking into account the independent recommendations of the public inquiry. Mr. Michael McJimsey. Uh, could I ask the Minister, uh, in terms of noise pollution and policing it and so on, is he satisfied with the current regime, which is just a straight lift uh, from a table on the mainland, and in particular uh, the regime around tonal quality, which is the worst type of uh, 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 definition of noise when you get a tonal quality that, that, that is unbearable, and you, see, you hear that around uh, Belfast City Airport, and furthermore, is he satisfied that the policing arrangements, namely local authorities policing this uh, uh, regime, is sufficient uh, to uh, deal with the issue? I thank the member for uh, that question, and it is indeed a question that has been raised by uh, residents who have expressed concerns in, in the, the past. Now, the recently published Airport Commission recommended that an independent Aviation Noise Authority should be set up and act as a competent authority under the new EU regulation 598-2014, which comes into force next June. I understand that the final decision on this issue has still to be made by DFT, and it would not be for my department to lead here in the north, but it would be for DRD. Mr. Rob Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for recognising that the George Best City Airport has, uh, is a responsible, if even a noisy, uh, neighbour to, to, uh, to endure. But would the Minister agree with me that, uh, in terms of what the airport makes to the contribution to the economy and the employment of 1,500 people, plus all the other businesses that it supports in the uh, Greater Belfast area, that indeed, uh, when he takes, when he does his work, that he would take into account all of those other aspects. I thank the, the member for that question, and I did in my answer to Mr. McKinney refer that this is a finely balanced issue where one has to take into consideration the justifiable uh, objections of nearby residents and the other interests, namely the huge economic significance of the airport and all the benefits that it brings, not just to Belfast City, but to the north as a whole. It is a major employer. It puts Belfast City on the map. Uh, it has so many flights coming in and out. It makes Belfast easy to get to. It makes Belfast easier to get out of, which is, <laughs> this is always something I'm glad to do. Uh, so these are things that we certainly uh, certainly do need, need to look at in, in the round, and it, it will all be taken into consideration. Mr Sean Lynch for a question. Question three. The SPPS, which I published in September, states that in relation to unconventional hydrocarbon extraction, there should be a presumption against their exploitation until there is sufficient and robust evidence on all environmental impacts. I believe that this is a sensible and reasonable approach. Members will be aware that the SPPS must be taken into account by councils in the preparation of their new local development plans, in this case for Mana and Oma <coughs> District Council, and is also material to all decisions on individual planning applications and appeals by the relevant planning authority. At independent examination, Local development plans will be scrutinised to ensure that they take sufficient account of the SPPS and other central government plans, policy and guidance. My department can, if necessary, direct the Council to, to either modify or withdraw a plan document if it does not take sufficient account of regional planning policy. The provisions of the SPPS apply to the whole of Northern Ireland, including County Fermanagh, I believe that SPPS provides clarity and certainty to councils and everyone affected by and interested in planning decisions in relation to this form of development. 
Members will also be aware that as part of the transfer of the majority of planning powers from my department to councils, a hierarchy of development for local, major and regionally significant developments was introduced. Should an application be considered to be a regionally significant development proposal, then it will be dealt with by my department as planning authority, but under the same planning policy framework. Mr. Lynch for supplement. Uh, and I want to thank the Minister for his uh, answer and I acknowledge that he has visited Fermanagh on a number of occasions and he has mentioned the SPP uh, statement and he said presumption against exploitation until there is sufficient and robust evidence in all environmental impacts. Could he expand slightly on that? <coughs> uh, I, I thank the, the member for that question and acknowledging my visits to his constituency on this issue and uh, many others. There has been huge concern and opposition to fracking, not just in Fermanagh, not just in the north, but right across the, the, the world. And many of those with concerns about it have pointed to its potential impact on the environment and also its potential impact on, uh, the, on human and animal health. I think where such concerns do exist, it is a reasonable and sensible approach to establish that this practice is indeed safe and does not cause harm to the planet or to people before allowing any such application to proceed. It is that precautionary approach that I have taken in this case, and as I say, I believe it is the sensible approach and has certainly been well received by the people, or by many people, if not most in uh, the members' constituency. Some of the concerns that have been raised around environmental impact relate to hydrology, potential impact on local drinking water supplies, uh, the impact, undoubted impact on the landscape and resultant impacts on habitats and species. There are also, as I have uh, re referred to, concerns about potential impact on human health. They have been raised locally and uh, very loudly shall I say, in the, the USA as well, where I know extensive uh, research has been carried out over a number of years and uh, is as yet inconclusive. Mr David McNary. Mr. Speaker, we have just heard the Deputy Minister uh, before this Minister highlight uh, his concerns on high energy costs. And, and I know uh, this Minister can uh, be comical in his answers as I hope he was to uh, Mr Lynch. Uh, has he the full backing of the executive for his approach as he's outlined to the House on fracking? I uh, thank the, the member for that comical question. It's in keeping w w with his comical statements on a range of issues in recent weeks and months. I can assure uh, the member that the SPPS, which we are discussing, which includes the presumption against fracking has, I, for it I did seek and did receive executive approval, contrary to Sammy Wilson's belief when he appeared in local papers saying that I had perhaps breached the ministerial code by publishing the SPPS. I, I, I did, as I say, obtain full uh, minister, or executive approval prior to its uh, publication. As I said earlier too, I believe that this is a reasonable and sensible approach and the fact that Mr McNary thinks that it wasn't confirms to me that it is. Mr Alban McGuinness. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers uh, thus far. Uh, could I ask the Minister, uh, in relation to the All-Ireland study or research into fracking, um, is there a, a health dimension to that study, and if there's not, would one be usefully added to it? I thank uh, Mr McGuinness for that question. I can reassure the member that the All Island Joint Research Programme is tasked with looking at the issue of health impacts from unconventional gas exploration and extraction, or UGI. The research is looking at the potential health impacts derived from impacts on environmental media, for example, exposure to chemicals, vibration, light, noise, and pollution of environmental media such as soils, air, and water, with a view to preventing environmental factors from degrading human health. 
The research will also undertake a review of health impact studies worldwide in order to develop a suitable protocol. This is set out in the terms of reference as a specific task which states the potential role of health impact assessment in relation of UGI projects or operations should be considered based on the experience in other countries and recommendations should be made towards developing a protocol in the island of Ireland context. Also, as a result of comments received to the public consultation exercise on the terms of reference for the research programme, an official from the Health Service Executive of Ireland was added to the programme steering committee. I call Mr. Robin Swan. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister has given reassurances of the strategic plan and policy statement in regard to Fermanagh and Fraggan. Could he also give those reassurances to North Antrim? And could he give reassurances that the SPPAS will also cover the threat of lignite that he still hasn't addressed to the people in North Antrim? I, I thank the member for that question. He caught me with a similar one before, but I've come prepared today. The Northern Area Plan 2016 designates a lignite protection area in the Ballymoney Borough. The purpose of this designation is to preserve this important resource in the event that there should be future difficulty in accessing external energy sources. The recently published SPPS sets out the planning policy framework for the determination of all planning applications across Northern Ireland. It retains, in a strategic way, the mineral policy of a planning strategy for rural Northern Ireland. The SPPS states that in preparing their local development plans, councils should bring forward appropriate policies and proposals that reflect the policy approach of the SPPS, which are tailored to the specific circumstances of the plan area. This includes ensuring that sufficient supplies of aggregate are available at the local and regional level, safeguarding mineral resources and ensuring workable mineral resources are not sterilised by other surface development which would prejudice future exploitation and identifying areas which should be protected from minerals development. Oh, Mrs. Dolores Kelly for a question. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question four, Minister. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change will hold its 21st Conference of the Parties in Paris from the 30th of November to the 11th of December 2015. I will be attending as part of the official delegation from the 6th to the 8th of December at what, in my view, is the most important global conference of our time. Climate change is a global challenge that requires a global solution. It affects us all and we must all work together to play our part in tackling it. That's why I'm keen to frame my input to the Paris discussions from an island of Ireland perspective. That is why I am keen on a climate change conversation that includes everyone. To that end, I met with Minister Kelly and the delegation of church leaders to discuss common issues of concern to be taken forward in Paris. We acknowledge that all of society, including the churches, should encourage and promote understanding of the causes and impacts that climate change has on our daily lives. In preparation for COP21, all 28 EU member states gave a commitment to the EU binding target of at least a 40% domestic reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 compared with 1990. I fully endorse this approach and believe it will make a meaningful contribution towards achieving a balanced international agreement in Paris. At the conference in Paris, I will be making it clear that I believe that we should be striving to secure an ambitious international agreement and that the north of Ireland will play its full part in contributing to the agreed emission reduction targets. To help do so, I shall shortly be seeking views for proposals on climate change legislation which will help inform the executive and assist the introduction of a Northern Ireland climate change bill. We need a global agreement in Paris which is unquestionably in our and the entire global community's best interests. Mrs. Kelly for supplementary. I thank the Minister for a very comprehensive answer and a, and a sensible approach to what is one of the biggest challenges of the 21st century. I wonder, Minister, in terms of your executive colleagues and getting commitment uh, in terms of the aspects of legislation that you might wish to bring forward where they would be responsible, I think in particular DARD, for example. I just wonder what commitment you have and if, if there's anything you can expand further on the legislative uh, timetable that you have in mind. 
I, I thank the, the member for that question. This issue is very uh, topical and was indeed the subject of an extensive and interesting debate in the Chamber yesterday. And while the vote in the Chamber yesterday did indeed mandate me again to proceed with the introduction of climate change legislation, one thing that the division did was highlight that this is an issue on which we do not yet have consensus. That's what I have been doing over the past two years. I've been attempting to build consensus for, and indeed momentum for, climate change legislation. There's been good work being done uh, across all the departments, I have to say, through the cross-departmental working group on climate change. And all departments are making efforts within their departments to uh, reduce carbon emissions and so forth. I think it's vital that we do so. The member uh, mentions DARD, and of course it is the agri-food or agriculture as the sector here in Northern Ireland and indeed the island of Ireland that causes most emissions. There have been concerns expressed in the past and indeed <laughs> the not too distant past yesterday that any climate change, leg climate change legislation here in the north might impact upon the productivity of our farmers. This isn't necessarily the case. I think it's important that we work with the agri-food sector. I have done so already through the establishment of my prosperity panel and uh, my world-leading prosperity agreements, where we have seen that by actually going beyond environmental compliance, businesses, including those in the agri-food sector, have been able to boost their performance, not just environmentally, but financially as well. I think we need more of this type of work. We need to, in this chamber and from this chamber, show real leadership on this issue as well. Mr. Pat Sheehy. I thank the, the Minister for his answer there uh, and very detailed answers. I listened carefully and uh, it appears he is intent, intent on uh, developing a climate change bill for the North. Could you give us some more details on that in terms of when he expects to do that and what's going to be involved in that climate change bill? I, I, I thank the member for that question. I think realistically there's not, we're not going to see the introduction of climate change in or during this mandate and that's something that causes me regret. As I have said over the past two years, I have been attempting to build consensus, I believe we are making slow but steady progress in that regard. And I think the topicality of this issue and the huge media coverage that has been afforded to the ongoing conference in Paris and the issue of climate change is something that we can work to our advantage here. The fact that we are the only jurisdiction on these islands that doesn't have its own climate change legislation is something that causes me as Minister, a degree of embarrassment, but it's something that should cause us all collectively as a, as a devolved assembly a great deal of embarrassment. Like I said, it's something we do need to show leadership on. I've circulated a high-level discussion paper among executive colleagues and other stakeholders outlining how I believe a climate change bill here might look. I don't expect everyone to like how it, it, I, how I would want it to look, but it's something that I would be prepared to, to compromise on. And whoever succeeds me as Minister with uh, responsibility for uh, climate change policy should, should certainly take on board in order to get some legislation over the line here. Ms. Anna Lou. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I really want to thank the Minister for his very comprehensive answers to the question. And I, I do feel the passion from him and the enthusiasm from him about the climate change legislation in Northern Ireland, really want to thank him for that. But as he says that it is not going to happen in this mandate with you being the minister, how does he feel with the new structure of the, the two departments with that and DOE working together. Um, is it going to enhance the possibility of getting that legislation or is it going to be a hindrance? I, I, I thank the member for that uh, question. I'm not sure though how she felt my passion. I hope it was as good for her as it was for me. <laughs> 
The new departmental setup could, could work one, one. It could work e either way. There are potentially advantages in the uh, amalgamation of agriculture and an environmental policy, and that it will bring officials from those departments closer together and hopefully working towards common goals. However, the member I know is, is well aware of concerns that have been expressed from uh, the environmental sector that this might be, not be an amalgamation uh, of environment and agriculture. It might be a subsumption <laughs> of environment into agriculture. I think it's very important, therefore, that we have DOE in as strong a position as possible, and not just the department itself, but also the environmental NGOs to, to which I referred prior to uh, the, the, the restructuring of departments. That's why I've moved to give them some certainty moving into the, the new departmental structures with the establishment of my new natural en environment fund, because I recognise the importance of work, not just of officials in the various government departments, but also within that sector who have years and years of experience and expertise that we should be availing of at every opportunity. Well, Mr. Fran McCann. With regards to the allocation of resources under the local government reform programme, I can only speak about the planning function which my department transferred to councils. As I have previously advised members, I took a brave and bold decision to ring-fence the planning budget that was passed to local government. My action guaranteed the planning resource allocation would not be impacted by the disproportionate in-year cuts which my department had to absorb. I stand by that decision. It was the right thing to do. I am the Minister who honoured the commitment given by the Executive to the sector that functions should be cost neutral at the point of transfer, even though this meant that I had to make bigger cuts in different areas of my own department. As Minister for the Department of the Environment, I stood up to the mark. I pressed the Finance Minister and other Ministers to do the same. They did not. It is therefore for those Ministers to defend their decision regarding the resource allocations they transferred to Councils. That said, I will not stop doing everything I can to persuade my executive colleagues to ensure that local government is adequately resourced to fulfil its new duties, whilst councils continue to provide good quality service to our citizens and deliver value for money to their ratepayers. Mr McCann for supplementary. Uh, and I thank the Minister for his question, uh, or for his answer, sorry. Uh, but he knows that the, the, the councils are currently undertaking uh, a financial impact review, uh, which they believe will anticipate there will be anticipated costs in excess of 100 million. Uh, 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 how can he help towards uh, related costs uh, to help him to get over this uh, hurdle? I, I, I thank the member for that question. As I had outlined in, in my previous answer, I ensured that what function was transferring from my department, its budget was ring-fenced, so it did transfer in a manner that was cost-neutral to the ratepayer. I am aware, though, as Minister with Responsibility for Local Government, of the difficulties that our new councils are having, due largely to the transfer of some other functions. And I would refer and principally to the transfer of off-street car parking by DRD. It was something of a Trojan horse if I can use that term, <laughs> talking to Mr McCann in the, here, and that uh, there were huge hidden costs, and councils certainly feel that they got, they got a, a raw deal with regards to the transfer of that function, and the resource that came away, across with the function was nowhere near uh, satisfactory. I can tell you, continue with executive colleagues through uh, the partnership panel to work with local government identifying these issues and hopefully identifying ways that we can address these issues. It was always anticipated that uh, the reform of local government would cost money at the outset. It would cost money to central government and it would cost uh, money to local government, but those costs will be offset in the medium to long term through huge savings that can be made through uh, more collaborative work. Call Mr John McAllister. Thank you, um, Deputy Speaker. Um, I've raised this issue with the Minister before, and he will know one of the 
the transfers devolved to councils that has caused some of the biggest problems, particularly in my area, have been the planning function. Would he agree with me that it's now time that he and his executive colleagues set a target for planning decisions being made? The Minister, be very brief, please. I thank the member for that question. He and others have raised concern about Council's performance with their new uh, function of, of planning, and I think those concerns are justifiable and understandable, given that the quarterly uh, performance report that was published last week, which showed how Councils had dealt with planning applications in the first quarter of this year, showed that there had been a huge downturn in terms of output. I think that is understandable enough, given that it was a transition period teething problems were to be expected, and there were and have been uh, teething problems. There, I, I'm not going to try and deny that there are issues across different councils with inconsistencies of approach, not even to interpretation of planning policy and the making of planning decisions, but in fact there, there are differences in how planning uh, committees across the North conduct their business, who gets speaking rights for how long and so forth. There is a great deal of confusion out there for councillors and also for the public and applicants. I am actually on the 14th of December though, meeting with the 11 chief executives of the new councils. It is a one item agenda meeting and that item is planning. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. William Humphrey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers so far. The Minister will be aware that planning applications and the progression is a problem, particularly for industry. What more can the Minister and his department do to give assistance to those making applications? I, I thank the member for that question. I think the greatest assistance that anyone, uh, planning authority, can give to those making applications, particularly uh, applications that boost our economy, that create jobs, is certainty. That is what uh, developers want to see. That is what businesses want to see. They want to know the prospects of an approval. They want to know how long that approval might take. It was in the interest of giving certainty uh, to businesses and, and communities and social housing uh, providers that I published BMAP that I have pursued and published this SPPS, that does create certainty. Unfortunately, as I said, given that now councils retain or have responsibility for deciding on maybe 99 per cent of planning applications, and there does appear to be uh, inconsistencies in how they are processing a a applications, that is something that we do need to iron out in order to give anyone with an interest in doing business and setting up business and creating jobs, not just through the business that they are setting up, but also the construction of the premises required uh, for it. Uh, they need that certainty, and we, we all have a responsibility to provide that. Mr Humphrey, for supplementary. I thank the Minister for answers. Uh, can I say to the Minister that I, I am aware, from speaking to others uh, and from my own information, that applications seem to be down. Can I ask the Minister, if they are down and significantly down, what more can the Department of the Environment and the Minister that leads it uh, in terms of help can he give to local councils? I, I, I thank the member for that question. And did he mean that the number of applications is down or the number of applications being processed is down? It's my understanding, and now again this will be different in each council area, but council areas and council officials that I have been speaking to in se several council areas have pointed to an upturn in the number of applications. And, and I think that is demonstrated quite clearly. I know uh, last week, for example, Derry City and Straban District Council applied for three new planning officers. I do know in other council areas additional planning staff has been brought and to deal with an increase in the number of applications. That is indicative of the upturn in the economy. That, uh, that the members' ministerial colleagues tell us so much uh, about. Uh, it would not be necessarily for me as, as, as Environment Minister to boost the number of applications in an area. We do maybe have to look uh, is the reason for a lack of applications, the, the lack of prospect of approval, and maybe there, there, there is an issue to be looked at. Is that something in a particular aspect of the strategic planning policy statement, or indeed 
the, the proposal type that people might be thinking of, but not having the confidence to actually develop that into a full-blown planning application. Now, planning officials under the DOE and now under, under Council were available for pre-application discussions. If someone out there has an idea that they would like to, to test the water on to see if it would have a a reasonable prospect of success in the planning process, they can certainly approach the planning officials and, and council, seek a planning application, a pre-application discussion, uh, and hopefully be guided in the right direction as to how or where to submit that application. Mr. Thomas Buchanan for a topical question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the minister what measures or plans he, uh, what measures he plans to put in place, or, or advertising he plans to do in the run-up to the festive season to help reduce or curb road traffic accidents? I uh, thank the, 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 the member for that question. Uh, regrettably, traditionally, we do see an increase in the number of road traffic collision, collisions at this time of the year, the festive period. It's, the evenings are darker, there are more people on the road, people are rushing to do shopping, to get home and see family in worse uh, traffic conditions. Therefore, it is important that we do redouble our efforts at this time in an attempt to reduce the number of collisions on our road. To that effect, I have been working closely <coughs> with my road safety partners in the in the other departments, but also mainly in the emergency services, and primarily among them the, the PSNI, who have recently launched their annual uh, anti-drink driving uh, blitz, if you like. We have, uh, as the department, have, have renewed our advertising on uh, drink driving. I have also been working very hard with officials on the launch of a new social media strategy and advertising <coughs> campaign, specifically focusing on drink driving, which again uh, traditionally occurs more at this time of year, and the dangers posed by people using handheld devices. That will be uh, going live on social media uh, within the next couple of weeks, and it will be targeted specifically at young drivers. So I'm not sure if Mr Buchanan will get anything in his inbox about it. Well, Mr. Buchanan, for his supplementary. Thank the Minister for his response. Now, I am uh, interested in the social media because to catch the younger generation, then it's important that we get into the social media. But does the, the department have any way of measuring the shock measures from the advertisements this, this uh, put out across our television screens? I, I, I thank the, the member for that question, and indeed it, it is a question that I myself asked when I wasn't long into this post. Uh, the, ads that the DOE ha have put out have often been shocking, and that has been proven. There is scientific research that shows that that does work. It does permeate into people's consciousness, and it does most importantly affect or impact upon driver behaviour. In saying that, I do not think we should get into a situation where every ad has to be a blood and guts one. I think there has to be a balance in our approach to advertising. I think we do do that uh, quite well. Due to huge budget cuts that I encountered this year, or that the department suffered this year at the hands of the budget, the, the amount of money I have had to spend on road safety advertising has been virtually halved. Necessity is the mother of invention, as I say, and it is due to that that I have looked more at going down the social media route, which also enables us to specifically target certain demographics. It could be drivers under 25 living in rural areas. You can actually tell, well, I can't, and I'm not sure if you can, who, people who have interests in, in cars and things like that, and, and, and target them uh, with the information. I think that's a very good use of resource. Hopefully, hopefully we will see uh, the benefits of that in terms of the number of collisions, the number of serious injuries and the number of fatalities uh, being reduced on our roads. Mr John Rogers for a topical question. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. Minister, bearing in mind the recent torrential rain, could you outline to me how the emergency flooding financial assistance package currently operates? I uh, thank the member for that question. 
Article 26 of the Local Government Miscellaneous Provisions, Order 1992, makes provision for a scheme of emergency financial assistance to district councils. Financial assistance under this article takes the form of grants paid by my department with the consent of the FP. As a result, I have made emergency funds available to cover council costs incurred when responding to the needs of householders across Northern Ireland in the event of any flooding following rainfall or tidal surge from the 7th of November 2015 until the 31st of January 2016. The scheme of emergency financial assistance to district councils also includes an immediate payment of £1,000 to householders as practical assistance to those who have suffered severe inconvenience to help make homes habitable as quickly as possible. It is not a compensation payment, though. Circular LG31 2015, which provides advice to the scheme of financial assistance to councils, was issued to all councils on the 12th of November. Standard application and survey forms for use by householders and councils, respectively, are included in the circular, and claims for reimbursement must be submitted to the department using the templates provided in it. Application forms seeking reimbursement of expenditure relating to recent incidents must be submitted to the department within three months of the flooding incident occurring. Claims made outside of this period will not be eligible for reimbursement unless in exceptional circumstances where prior agreement has been reached with the department. Mr. Rogers for supplementary. Could I thank the Minister for that answer? And bearing in mind what you said, Minister, have you any plans to change the scheme? I thank the, the member for that question, and I do have plans to hopefully improve the scheme. Recently, I provided an executive paper, Flooding Standing Scheme of Emergency Financial Assistance to Councils, to my executive colleagues for their consideration and comments. My paper seeks executive agreement to create a standing scheme of emergency financial assistance to councils in relation to flooding incidents following heavy rainfall or tidal surge, rather than creating individual time-bound schemes which require individual approval. My aim for the introduction of a standing scheme is to improve reaction time and avoid the possibility of delay while approvals are sought. I have also included, and members will be glad to hear this, an additional proposal to extend the original scheme to allow for severe inconvenience payments to recreational and community buildings, churches and small businesses, that's businesses with less or fewer than 25 employees. As it exists currently, the scheme is only available to householders. However, we have seen in recent times, I can think of incidents, flooding incidents in, in, in Newry, and more recently in West Tyrone, where small businesses have suffered major inconvenience and major damage as a result of flooding, but haven't been able to avail of uh, this payment that householders are. I, I'm also aware in my own constituency of a church that suffered uh, flooding and serious inconvenience as, as a result and was unable to uh, avail of the payment as it wasn't deemed to be a house, although I did try to convince officials that it was the house of God and should be, should be eligible as such. Well, Mr Leslie Cree for topic. Mr Speaker, I ask the Minister how he expects the remaining powers of his department to be devolved to other departments uh, next year? Uh, I, I thank the member for that question. Uh, as we approach the elections in, in May and, and the subsequent restructuring of, of government departments, the functions of my department, uh, the, the DOE, will be being split three ways. As alluded to in an earlier answer to Ms Lowe, the classic environmental aspect of the work of, of the department, issues around climate change policy, environmental regulation and so forth will be amalgamating with uh, agriculture in the new Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Other aspects of my department's current workload, including road safety and planning, will be amalgamated with the current DRD in the new Department of Infrastructure, and, and I think that's a good fit. It's understandable that you would have road safety and along with the department that's responsible for uh, maintaining our roads network and actually implementing safety measures uh, on our roads. Planning will, will be in there too. 
which is again uh, understandable. Other uh, work such as responsibility for local government and indeed our built heritage will be comprised part of the new Department of Communities, which will also contain uh, many, if not all, of the functions of the current Department for Social Development. Again, you can see a lot of merit in that, particularly with Council's new community planning uh, function. They haven't got their regeneration function yet. That, uh, I know the DSD Minister announced that last week that he wouldn't be proceeding with that, although by being in the, the same department they should be able to maximise uh, the, the benefits of that for local ratepayers and citizens. Mr Leslie Cree for supplementary. Thanks very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, just on the other issue, Minister, um, do you expect the, the issue of the establishment of an independent environmental protection agency to be completed inside that time frame as well? I uh, thank the member uh, for that question. I think we seem to be well in the in injury time here. I know my beloved Everton conceded a goal late in the injury time on Saturday. I hope I don't score an own goal uh, at this stage in injury time today. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's safe to say I am on record, and again, I, I, I spoke in response to Ms. Lowe earlier about concerns that the the sector, the environment sector, have expressed about the amalgamation or subsumption of our environmental function into agriculture, given, I suppose, the emphasis, the appropriate emphasis that uh, this executive does put on the agri-food uh, sector. That's why I thought it was timely to reintroduce the debate around the need for an independent environment agency. I have a paper currently out for consultation on that. Uh, members will have a chance to, to respond. Uh, I, I think there are huge merits in that. We are the only jurisdiction on these islands that does not have an independent in, in environment agency, and I do not know what any party or any business or individual would have to fear from the establishment of such an agency. Your time is up. Members will take